Praise God, youth, and thank you for joining us today's service. I pray that you're all doing well and staying healthy. And as we start today's service, I ask if you have the ability to, to rise and sing with us through these songs. Things in the past, things yet unseen, wishes and dreams that are yet to come true. All of my hopes, all of my plans, my heart and my hands are lifted to you. Lord, I offer my life to you, everything I've been through. Use it for your glory. my praise to you as a pleasing sacrifice. Lord, I offer you my life. Things in the past, things yet unseen, wishes and dreams that are yet to come true. All of my hopes, all of my plans, my heart and my hand. To you, Lord, I offer my life to you. Everything I've been through, use it for your glory. Lord, I offer my days to you, lifting my praise to you as a pleasing sacrifice. Lord, I offer you. Oh! 
Lord, my Savior, loves me so. He will hold me fast. Hallelujah, God. We thank you for this day that you've given us, this beautiful day and this chance to come here, Lord. We know that we are here by your grace and your mercy, Lord, and the love that you have for us, that we're able to come here, Lord, in this house of worship, Lord, and worship you and sing songs of praise, Lord. And we pray that you continue to bless, bless us and be with us, Lord, as our journey, through our journeys, Lord, as Christians, Lord. We pray that you bless the service, Lord. You bless those in their homes watching today's live stream, Lord. We pray that you fill, us, fill this place with your presence, Lord, and fill them with your presence, Lord. Lord, and we pray that you bless, that you speak through the service today, Lord. Let your word be spoken through any sermons told today, Lord, and any songs, Lord. All this we pray in your name. Amen. First of all, thank you, worship team, for leading us into the service. Wonderful songs. Christ will hold me fast. Amen to that. I want to um, point out the first song that we all sang together. The worship team led us. But it, there were words in there that said, Lord, I give you my life. Right? I will give it as a sacrifice. Today I want to put that to the test. I want to ask you some questions that are going to be hard. And I'm going to make some assumptions that may or may not be true about you and about me. Uh, and we will test ourselves. It will not be a theological, but rather a very practical sermon today. Proverbs 11.24 says, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Yet another withholds unduly, yet comes to poverty. So one person gives freely. They're generously given out, but they keep getting more. And another person... They withhold even when they should give, but then they end up being broken poor anyways. Topic of my sermon today is put your money where your mouth is. Put your money where your mouth is. I want to think back to our youth retreat from two years ago. Our brother um, Arkady was there, and he gave us a very nice practical example of how we can know what we care about. And he said, if we take all of our spending and it's all in a nice laid out format in a credit card bill, he said, go in and circle the, the expenses that are for you personally, for your pleasure, for your entertainment, for your food, your body. Go in and circle the, the expenses that are, have to do with church, that you, where you're giving, where you're donating, right? And there was a third category I, I frankly forget, but it, it got me thinking, Lord, if I was to circle my credit card bill and all the expenses that I pay for in other ways, if I was to put them on one list, how much of that would be devoted to you, to your ministry, to your service, to your people, to the poor and to the needy? And so I want to explore those things. I want to ask you a very easy question. Should you give? Should you give? Should you give money? Should you give tithes? Should you give offerings? And I want to go to the Word of God and we're going to explore that. I know for a fact many of you do not tithe. I know for a fact many of you give an occasional offering at best, right? And I know for a fact that many of you actually do earn some money, right? Whether it's you're babysitting for someone, you get some money. Whether you have a job that's nine to five, you certainly have some income. What do you do with that income? I'm going to challenge you on that today and uh, allow the words of the Word of God to challenge you, but at the same time to encourage you, right? Uh, because there's much blessing to be gained in the things I'm going to talk about. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19, 21. We're answering the, the first question, should you give? Verse 19 says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where the thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A challenge of Jesus, give in such a way that you're storing treasures not on this earth, but in heaven. Why? Because the things that you store up on this earth, they're going to perish anyways. Newsflash, we're all going to die, right? If we don't die, we're going to meet Jesus coming on the clouds, but whatever we possess at that moment will be useless to us. I, I think back on the stories 
that my family was just discussing at a dinner table recently where people had money, people had savings that they stored in their, underneath their pillows and underneath their mattresses. And overnight, the Soviet Union changed the currency and all the money became nothing more than just useless pieces of paper. People worked, right? And suddenly, all of their possessions were gone. And that can happen to us anytime. We don't know how much the dollar is going to hold its value. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know, God forbid, if one of our houses breaks down or, or burns down or whatever the case may be. But we know who holds our tomorrow, right? And we, we know that there is a place where we can invest our funds that are going to be there no matter what occurs to us here on earth. Paul explains these words, this concept of storing up treasures in heaven. He talks to rich people. Right? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17, he addresses, he says, you rich people, or you who have some possessions. And in, in verse 18, he says, they are, so the, the rich people, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves as good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is, which is truly life. So he's saying, if you are storing these things, if you are rich in good works, if you are sharing with those who need it, guess what? You are laying a good, sound foundation. You are storing those treasures in the heavenly realms where nothing can break in. I want to think back to the words of Jesus Christ. One more important concept for us to remember. Jesus says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Brothers and sisters, if you refuse to take away from yourself now to give, I guarantee you as your possessions get greater, which they will, God willing, God will bless you with a good job, with a stable income. As your possessions get greater, it is more difficult for you to give out of your share of possessions. If you have $100 and you give 10, believe me, it will be much more difficult to give $100 when you have 1000 Believe me, it will be much more difficult to give $1,000 when you have 10000 It will be more difficult to give 10000 when you have 100000 Right? Just think about that. Right? But for now, the Lord says, be faithful in a little, and I will place you over much. I know I'm taking that passage out of context, but the concept holds true. If God has given you a little, show your faithfulness in that which you have. And demonstrate to even yourself, God doesn't need your evidence. This is more for us. Lord, my treasure is not here. My treasure is in heaven. Put your money where your mouth is. You just sang a song. I just sang a song. Lord, I give you my life. I lay myself down as a sacrifice. But are you even holding back a tenth of your income from the Lord? So if we have, if we thought about the concept, should you give? And, and my encouragement is absolutely you should give. We're going to get to a few more passages that will further solidify my point. Uh, I want to think on one more concept. What happens when you encounter the Lord? What happens when you encounter God truly? For everybody, that's individual. But I will tell you what happened to Abraham when he, when he encountered Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the priest of the God Most High after a great victory. Where he's coming back and he meets Melchizedek. And Melchizedek here is a representative of God. You know what he wants to do? No one told him there was no law. The Mosaic tithe was not yet established. Abraham says, I want to give you a tenth of my possessions. And so he does, right? Not because he had to, not because there was a law in place, but because he had the reverence to do so. A very similar thing happened to Zacchaeus. He meets Jesus. Jesus meets him where he's at. He goes to his house. Jesus says, listen, salvation is coming to this house. And Zacchaeus has a response, a visceral response. In order to demonstrate his genuine faith, there's something that happens naturally. He didn't have to force it. He said, whoever I have stolen from, I will give back fourfold, and I will give half of my possession to the poor. Right? That's greater than a tenth. I'm sure he's given at least 50% of his possessions, probably more based on what he's describing. Right? But it was not a, res a response to some rules or laws. It was a response to a genuine heart who wanted to please the Lord because the, they, that heart knew right, that it held in the first place these riches, these values of this earth. And now suddenly he met Jesus and he realized that's meaningless compared to something much more important. When Christ holds you fast, right, it's easy to lay your life down as a sacrifice because you realize what's truly important. So if we agree that you should give, right, 
Men of God give when they meet God because they want to. They want to please the Lord. They're joyful in their giving, right? How should you give? We're going to go to the Word of God, Matthew 6, verses 1 to 4. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for when you have, then you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. How should you give? You should give in such a way that you are not receiving praise for your giving. Right? If you are whipping out several hundred dollar bills and openly counting them out in such a way that people around you can see how much you're giving, or if you're going back and you're handing somebody openly some cash and somebody sees, oh, that's a pretty big check, guess what? You do receive a reward for that. People around who saw it, they're going to they're gonna acknowledge you. They're going to say, you know what? That person's very generous. They're going to say good things about you. They're going to say, you know what, next time we do a collections, you should come up to that person. You're going to gain some level of respect from the people around you. Is that what's valuable to you? If it is, continue to do it. Jesus says don't do that, though, because the reward that you gain here is miserable compared to the reward that you will receive from the Father if you give the way Jesus instructs us to give. He said when you give, do not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, Right? What that means is essentially you shouldn't be telling others how much you're giving, right? You should give out of the joyful heart. You should give out of your abundance, right? And sometimes you should give out of your need. We, we think back to the story of the, of the woman, of the widow who had two mites. And she comes and Jesus recognizes her, right? Nobody else recognized her. She wasn't giving it openly, Right? She wasn't throwing in the coins in such a way that everyone would recognize her. Why? Because it was embarrassing what she was giving. It was a miserable amount, maybe enough for one meal, right? But Jesus knew that that's all that she had. Those were her possessions, right? Giving to the temple at that time meant she was not going to eat dinner that night. She gave not out of her abundance, but out of her need, and God or Jesus appreciated that, right? And that is the example that we get in the Bible, how we are to give. So when the Father sees us giving in secret that he will reward us. That is a promise, right? Whenever we give, I want you to realize when we give with a joyful heart, when we give to the Lord in the name of the Lord, we will receive a reward. We should not give for the sake of that reward because then we're just being manipulative. But if we give to the Lord with a genuine heart, it will come back to you. Place your bread upon the waters, then in due time, it will return to you. That's essentially just a proverb saying, when you have place it. Let other people receive the blessing that you have received from the Lord. Remember, what you have is not yours. It's the Lord's. And he was kind enough to share it. And he is kind enough to even say, listen, a tenth, 10%, you get to keep 90. He could have said, give me 50%, and he would have been right in saying that. But nowhere does he demand 50. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 8. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever, whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. An important verse, an important concept. You should give what you have decided to give. For example, you're listening to a sermon and a need is announced. And they say, you know, there's wells that need to be dug in Africa. Or there's a need somewhere in Ecuador. Or there's somewhere in Ukraine where there's a building project. And the Lord places it in your heart. You should give $100 today. Right? Suddenly in our mind we're going to start reasoning. Well, all I have in my wallet is $100 and I still have to buy milk on the way home. Or, I really don't want to waste all my cash because I may need it at some point. Well, what if I need it to pay a toll, right? If the Lord is placing it on your heart to give what you have chosen, give that money, right? Give it joyfully, right? And if the thoughts come your way where you shouldn't give it and you're really fighting within yourself, don't give because you're not giving joyfully anymore. You should not give under compulsion. Nowhere should somebody pressure you into giving for the sake of a need, right? You should hear it and you should re want to re uh, pay or bless the brothers and sisters who need it. 
And it's important to remember, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Right? When you're giving cheerfully, that's what's valuable to the Lord. When we think back on tithing, if you, if you think back on Brother Alex, but Brother had a, a sermon series in our church on tithing, and essentially the conclusion was, which is the correct conclusion, that tithe, as a rule, was not reinstituted in the New Testament. It was not, right? Many people will argue that. But there was concepts right, where Jesus said, because this tithing concept was in place, people made it into a law, and then they beat other people with it. You don't tithe, therefore I'm better than you. And this is why Jesus went after the heart of the giver rather than after the concept of a tithe, right? I think if you love the Lord, you should give at least 10%, right? Some people say, well, 10% is a lot. If we think back to Israel, and, and Alex was very eloquent in displaying this, they didn't pay 10%. They paid 23 There was a 10% that went to the civil government. There was a 10% that went to the temple, and there was another Tenth that happened once every three years for the poor and the widow and for newcomers, right? If you do the math on that, that's 23.3% that people were giving. That's essentially the U.S. federal tax rate, right? But that's what people were giving to Israel at the time. Some people will say we don't have a civil government that we need to support anymore because we have a democracy and they're already taking the taxes. Fine. That leaves you with 13%, right? 13% that you can use to bless the church, 13% that you can do to bless the widow and the, new, the people who are in need. Again, I don't want to get hung up on percentages because I don't think that's what's important. I think the heart is what's important. And that's the pattern we see in the New Testament. In verse 8, it says this, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things, at all times you may abound in every good work. So Paul says, when you are a cheerful giver, right, when you give with a cheerful heart, not under compulsion, but because you want to, because you want to bless someone, he reminds us who's in control, that God is the God of all grace. He's able to make things abound to you. And why is he doing that? Because he has all the sufficiency and he wants to bless you in such a way that you fulfill the good works that he's prepared for you to do as we read in Ephesians 2, right? God is invested in you doing good works, are you? Are you putting your money where your mouth is? Because we all say we love Jesus. We all say we love God. Most of us say we love our church. Let's test that. If your money is not going to the things that you love, do you genuinely love the things that you say that you love? I want to answer one more question. How do we prioritize our giving? And then we're going to sum things up. So should we give? I think we agree. Based on the Bible, the answer is certainly yes. How should we give? We should che give cheerfully. We should give not under compulsion. We should give out of our abundance as well as out of our need, right? And we should give at least, I hope, a 10%. That's the pattern I see in the Bible. Again, not reinstituted in the New Testament. However, it is, it is a good pattern to follow at least a tithe or at least a 10%. And you should not give in such a way that people will praise you because then your reward in heaven will be lost. So who should you give to or how should you prioritize your giving? 1 John 3, 16, 18. By this we, we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. This is a great theological verse, right? Jesus laid down his life for us. He's given everything he had for us. And in the same way, we ought to lay down our lives for brothers. And then Paul explains practically what that looks like, because that sounds great. But here's the practical application of what you laying down your life for a brother looks like. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against them, how does God's love abide in him? So John, I'm sorry, John asks a very good question. He says, okay, you have the world's goods, but you see your brother in need, and you don't give to him. You don't bless him. You don't help him out. Your heart is closed. Paul, or I'm sorry, John is asking, how do you say that God's love abides in you? Jesus laid his life down for you. You should lay down your life for the brother, but you can't even help him. How does God's love abide in you is the question he asks. Then the instruction, little children... Let us not love in word 
or talk, but in deed and in truth. I'm going to read that again. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Your talk is cheap. You coming up to a brother and saying, I love you, but not being willing to help him when he's in need, that's cheap. That's meaningless. John says, love in deed and in truth. And if you love someone in truth, you'll be compelled out of the joy of your heart to bless that person when you see them in need. And again, the beautiful thing about a fellowship of believers is that's not a one-way road. Right? We bless others when we have an abundance. We bless others that are in need. But brothers and sisters, I've lived this. I've, I've experienced this many, many times. When I'm in need, right? And sometimes I don't even think I'm in need, but the Lord sees better and he blesses other brothers and sisters to come alongside and to help, to, to bless me materially, to bless me with words of encouragement, to bless me in other ways. The things that I need at the time. Now, the Lord is good beyond all measure. I'm not saying that he does these things to me because I'm good. He he does them out of his grace. But he uses people in this very church to do so. And I'm so thankful. And it brings me closer to them and them closer to me. And when I look at people in this church, and again, I miss seeing their faces here. And I can't wait until I can do that again. I can tell you that I love them, right, because we've been through some things together. We've suffered some pain together. They have supported me on the the hands of prayers, (coughs) as, as have I to them. And that's valuable. I want to read one more passage that's going to sort of bind all these th- concepts together. In Malachi, which is an Old Testament, right, there's this great passage, verse 3, verses 8 to 11. Really, the whole chapter talks about this, but I wanted to narrow it down. <clears throat> God, through a prophet, says this, Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? And then the answer in your tithes and in your contributions or in your tithes and in your offerings. You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. So Jesus says Israel is cursed because they're robbing God's temple. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke and devour for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. The concept is very simple. The Lord says, you're robbing me. You're not giving the things that are due to me, right? There was a law that they weren't following, right? And he says, you're cursed because of that. He says, if you put me to the test, if you bring the appropriate tithes into the house, will I not bless you more than you can even imagine? Right? This concept's hold true. Right? If our church has a need and we are not fulfilling that need, although we have an abundance, why do we even expect a blessing from the Lord if we don't even care about his house? But the Lord says, test me in Malachi. He says, test me, will I not open the windows of heaven? Will I not open the abundance of blessing, right? Don't ever think when you're given to the Lord that you're given to someone who's in need. He doesn't need your money, right? But your giving is just an indication or an outpouring of what you say you have if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Put your money where your mouth is. So should we give? Certainly yes. How should we give in such a way that nobody sees what you're doing, right? Not the way till you get rewards. You should give out of your abundance and out of your need, right? And you should give to the Lord. Who should you give to? I want to emphasize the priority of that question. Sort of circle back. Malachi says that there is a priority to bring the tithes into the house of God. The church, the house of God, is the place first and foremost, that needs to be taken care of by us as members of this church. Our bills need to be paid, right? Whatever projects we have going on, they need to be sponsored. Why? Because that's us bringing money into the house of God, right? In the future, when there are people on staff, when when the Lord blesses us, that we are able to do that, we need to make sure that there is not a budgetary deficit in that area. That is our responsibility. And the Lord says, I will bless you if you take care of that. 
Secondly, in 1 John, we read that you should give to your brother who's in need. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you, right, to give first to those who are in need in your immediate body of believers. We should look first here, right? In James, we read that true religion is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their distress. Do we have orphans and widows in our church? Do we have orphans and widows that you know maybe in your churches at home or your relatives? Certainly, may God place them on your heart that you support them with your financial blessings that you have acquired. I want to encourage you, dear youth. Again, I can speak sternly and I can speak very directly to you where maybe I will not allow myself to do that in, in our general assembly. Give to God what is due to him. He has blessed you. Right? There are people in other countries which, who don't have what you have. Right? Allow your joy that the Lord has put into your heart be uh, externally presented in the offerings that you give to God. Bless the brothers and sisters around you. Look for somebody who's in need. Don't wait for them to come and ask you. Look. And if the Lord shows you a brother in our church, if the Lord shows you someone around that is in need, bless them. Why? Because the question is, if you don't bless the brother who's in need, how does God's love abide in you? Well, I can turn that question around and say, if you bless the brother and sister in the need, that is the demonstration of God's love abiding in your life. Will you lay down your life as a sacrifice? Will you put your money where your mouth is? Will you only speak, right, love, or will you demonstrate love? I challenge you to be good stewards of that which you have. Let us pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, I thank you for this youth. Lord, I thank you for the blessings that you have blessed us with. Lord, I thank you that we have jobs. Lord, I thank you that we have money. I thank you that none of us go hungry in this church. Father, that we have and we have an abundance. Father, and I just pray that you teach us, Lord, that you teach the youth, Lord, to give. Lord, in the small that they have now, Lord, that they give out of Jesus the, the summer jobs. Lord, that they give out of the babysitting jobs. Lord, that they learn to give now. Father, so that when you bless them more abundantly, they can bless others more abundantly, Lord. So that they can bring their tithes into the storehouses of your house, Lord, that our church can be blessed, Lord. Father, when you bless us with a building, if this is the building or another building, Lord, that we will be able to afford it. Lord, that we will be able to make it great, Jesus. That people come here, they repent, Jesus, that they learn to love you, Lord. And there are people, Jesus, that are filling your kingdom through this church body. Lord, I just pray that you give us the wisdom to put Lord, our money where our mouth is, Lord, and just to follow, Jesus, your example and your instructions on how we should give, when we should give, and where we should give. Father, I thank you for all these things. Amen.
Praise God, brothers and sisters, dear youth. It is a privilege to be here before you. It is a privilege to speak the word of God before you today. And I, I really enjoyed the sermon that Slav just, um, just preached. His was, put your money where your mouth is. And mine is a little similar. But not put your money where your mouth is, but put your actions where your mouth is, or kind of act the way you're speaking. So I believe that many of us, or all of us who are listening, claim that we are Christians. And we claim that we live Christian lives. Many of us claim to know Jesus Christ and claim that we follow him and serve him. And that we are saved. But do we act exactly how we say? Do we act like Christians? Do we speak like Christians? Or can we truly be called Christians if, if people did not see our, um, or if they only saw us but did not hear us call ourselves that? So one story that I want to read from the Bible today Одна історія, яку я хочу почитати з Біблії сьогодні, is from Matthew chapter 26. Матвія 26 розділ. It's verses 30 to 35. Від 30 до 35 вірша українська буде на екрані. And it says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount, Ol Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Now this is an interesting um, passage that I chose. Especially for my topic, for putting your words behind your actions or your actions behind your words. But I chose this one on purpose because this one has a very important meaning in the end. And as we see, um, Peter is with Jesus Christ here, as are the other disciples. And Jesus is telling them that they will be stumbled because of him. And Christ knows what's about to happen. He knows the prophecy. And he tells them that the sheep will be scattered. But Peter, who is very bold, he says, I will not stumble. Even if the rest of them stumble, if everybody else stumbles, I will not stumble. And he says, I will, um, Jesus tells him, you will deny me three times. But Peter stands firm on what he says. He says, even if I need to die, I will not deny you. And Christ knew their hearts. Maybe Peter wanted to stand with Christ. He wanted to not leave his side. But at that time, uh, shortly after, we will see that he did not have the power to stand with him. But what's important to note here 
that when we are with Christ, is Christom, when things are um, going easy, things are going good, dobra, dear youth, it is easy for us to say that we will be by Christ. Moli, dużo lehko nam skazati, що ми будемо з Христом. It's easy to um, have all this courage to say, I will be a Christian in hard times. Легко сказати, мати сміливість сказати, що я буду християнин навіть в тяжкі часи. But those hard times have not come yet. Але ті тяжкі часи ще не прийшли. And people do this all the time. І люди це роблять постійно. Dear youth, we make this mistake all the time. Дорогі молодь, ми робимо цю помилку часто. We make these promises or these vows that we believe that we're never going to have to actually keep because that time will not happen. And Peter does exactly that. He makes this vow to Jesus. Even if I have to die, I will not leave your side. I will not deny you. But we know that in just a few short hours, when the time gets put to put your words into actions, the test of your faith is here що екзамен вашої віри прийшов, or the value of your words, або цінність ваших слів. What will your will your words have value and will you pass that test? Чи ваші слова будуть мати цінність і чи ви пройдете цей екзамен? Sometimes we say things so quickly we don't even understand the magnitude of what we're saying. Часом ми настільки швидко щось говоримо, що ми не розуміємо велич того, що ми сказали. And let us read, continue reading from um, Matthew chapter 26. Verse 69. 69. And it says, Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later those who stood by, the, by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for you speech, your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Now we see... Th- uh, now we see Peter's words in action. When Christ is in trouble, Christ is being um, held by the crowd. Peter is watching this. He sees the crowd surround him. And now they're accusing him of being a follower of Christ. But Peter, seeing the crowd and seeing the violence and seeing the anger, he says, I do not know him. The vow that he made to never deny Christ, even to death, just a few hours later is broken. And not just one time, but three times. And it says the first time, it says he just denied him. It says the second time, he denied with an oath. And a third time, he began to curse and swear and deny. Each denial greater than the last. It was more firm. But yet he denied him those three times. Because he feared something worse, uh, worse at that time. He feared what he did not believe he would have to fear so short, shortly after he made that vow. He feared death. He didn't want the crowd to come and take him. He saw what they were doing to Jesus. He did not want to be next. He had, he had the fear. He had fear of the flesh. 
and he was afraid to be taken with him. І він боявся, щоб його також візьмуть. But there's something very important that happens after that rooster crowed. Але щось дуже важливе сталося після того, як проспівав півень. It says that right after that rooster crowed that Peter remembered. Після того, як півень проспівав, Петро згадав. He remembered the words of Jesus Christ. Він згадав слова Ісуса Христа. Where Jesus said before the rooster crows you will deny me three times. Де Ісус сказав перед тим, як півень проспіває два рази, ти три рази відрічайся від мене. And he had failed that vow that he made to Jesus just a few hours ago. І він провалив цю обітницю, яку він пару годин назад зробив Ісусові. And in the Gospel of Luke, it's recorded that in that moment that the rooster crowed, or in that moment where he denied him um, the third time and that rooster crowed, that Jesus made eye contact with um, Peter. І в Євангелії від Луки там описується, що перед тим, як Півень заспівав, то Петро і Ісус, вони звелися очима. And at that time, he was already... He was already feeling, feeling shame because he denied Jesus Christ. But now even make an eye contact while denying him. That guilt must have been there. That even though I promised you something, Jesus, Jesus to be something, Jesus, But now I have broken that promise. I thought it may have been easy at the time. When we're sitting there together and there was no, um, there was no struggles, there was no, there was no um, worries. Коли ми сиділи разом, не було ніякого пережиття, ніяких, ніяких проблем. I can make you that promise. Я міг зробити цю обітницю. But now in this hard time and all this struggle and all the chaos that is going on. Але тепер тут цей хаос, тут ці проблеми. I cannot keep my promise. Я не можу виповнити свою обітницю. And when the words were te- uh, tested, і коли ці слова були провірені, Peter failed. І uh, Петро, він не мав успіху, він провалив. And what's interesting to me is when I read this, when I read these uh, um, passages, і коли я читаю ці місця, I just remember our own failures. Я пам'ятаю наші наші неуспіхи. Our own weaknesses. Наші слабості. Just as Peter, the rock, так як навіть як Петро, камінь, he failed Jesus. Він він не догодив Ісусові. He failed his promise. Він не дотримав свою обітницю. So do we. We fail our promises as well. І також ми ми також ламаємо свої обітниці. And we fail all the time. І ми весь час весь час провалюємо це. We make promises to God all the time. Ми робимо обітниці Богові часто. We always pray to Him and we say, "We'll do something." Ми часто молимося і кажемо, ми щось зробимо. But when time goes by, we forget. Але коли час проходить, ми забуваємо. And we completely just don't do it or ignore it. І ми ігноруємо і не виповняємо цього, що ми казали. We do this to our friends. Ми це робимо своїм друзям. Maybe to our families. Можливо, для наших сімей. And yet, when times get hard, коли час стає тяжким, we fail on our promises. Ми не дотримуємо свої обітниці. We can't hold them through. Ми не, не виповняємо їх. But in the life of a Christian, а в житті християнина, this is to be expected. Це можна очікувати. The struggle. Це пережиття. The struggle in our Christian lives. Ці, ці е, трудності в нашому християнському житті. I would like us to open up to John chapter 16. Я хочу, щоб ми відкрили Івана 16 розділ. And we're going to read verses 31 down to 33. Від 31 до 33 вірша. And it says, Jesus answered them, Do you know, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I, I have overcome the world. And Jesus speaks to the disciples here. Ісус тут говорить до своїх учнів. And he tells them. І він їм говорить. Before the, before um, he is betrayed. Перед тим як як його зрадять. He says, "In me you will have peace." Він сказав, "Мені ви будете мати мир." And in this world you have, you will have tribulations. А в ці в цьому світі ви будете мати страждання. If we have decided to follow Jesus Christ. Якщо ми рішили сіти за Ісусом Христом. Then we will have tribulations. То ми будемо мати We're going to have troubles in our lives. Ми будемо мати проблеми в наших житті. 
And in those troubles, in those times, in those times, in those times, our words, our words will be tested. Наші слова будуть підвергені під екзамен. Our faith will be tested. Наша віра буде провірена. And in our actions, we will see if we will pass or we will fail. І в наших ділах провіриться, чи ми будемо мати успіх чи ні. But there is something very important that happens with uh, Peter. Але щось важливе стається з Петром. And this should happen with us in our Christian lives. І це має статися з нами в нашій християнській подорожі. It says that basically Peter failed that promise. Тут написано, що Петро не дотримав цю його обіцянку. But it says when he when he remembered. Але коли він згадав. He ran out of that temple, out of the house of um, out of that home. Він вибіг вибіг з цього дворця. And it says that he went out and he wept. І написано, що він пішов і він ридав. And why did he weep? Чому він ридав? Because he broke that vow to Jesus. Тому що він зламав цю обіцянку Ісусові. Even though he broke that vow, he did not lose his faith in Christ. Так, він зламав цю обіцянку, але він не загубив свою віру в Ісуса. He still believed in Christ. Він вірив в Ісуса. But he wept because he was weak and he could not keep that promise. Але він ридав тому, що він був слабий і не дотримав цю обіцянку. It is only human that you and I. Це просто понятно по людськи, що ти і я. We will sometimes fall in our weakness. Що ми будемо падати в нашій слабості. And we will sometimes break the promises that we make to God. І ми будемо ламати ці обіцянки, які ми робили Богові. But it is important that we do not lose our faith in Christ and God. Але важливо, щоб ми не загубили свою віру в Христа і в Ісуса. And Peter's Peter's the, um, denial. І відречення Петра. Was just only a worldly thing. Це було світська річ. That happened in a moment of his weakness. Воно сталося в момент його слабості. It was very temporary. Це було дуже тимчасове. Because we know when Jesus Christ was resurrected. Тому що ми знаємо, коли Ісус Христос воскрес. We know that when he came back and he spoke with Peter. Ми знаємо, коли він вернувся, він говорив з Петром. And he tells Peter. І він каже Петрові. To feed my sheep. Годуй мої вівці. And he tells him this three times. І це три рази він повторяє. Just as Jesus Christ was denied by Peter three times. Так само як і як і Петро відрікся від Ісуса Христа три рази. Jesus Christ tells him to feed his sheep three times. Ісус три рази повторяє, що він має кормити його вівців. And Peter і Петро, even though failing in the beginning, він провалив цю обітницю спочатку. He ends up becoming the rock of the church. Він стає камнем цей стає камнем церкви. The church of Jesus Christ. Церкви Ісуса Христа. And dear youth, I, in conclusion, друга молодь заключення. I just want to leave you with a couple words of encouragement. Я хочу лишити вас з декількома словами підбадьорення. I want you, I want our youth to speak truth. Я хочу, щоб наша молодь говорила правду. Let your let your heart be filled with the truth. Хай ваше серце буде наповнене правдою. Which is Jesus Christ. Який є Ісус Христос. And let the words you speak, the promises you make. І хай ці слова, які ви говорите, ці обіцянки, які ви робите. Let them be genuine and sincere. Хай вони будуть справжні і чесні. Because the words that you speak and the words that you promise. Тому що ці слова, які ви говорите, ці обіцянки, які ви робите. You must fulfill them. Ви мусите виповняти їх. You must stay true to your word. Ви мусите триматися свого слова. Because the value of your words. Тому що цінність ваших слів. Is what you will be tested on by the people that you are that you are closest to. Вони будуть провірені тими людьми, які навкруг вас. Did you keep your promises? Чи ви дотримали своєї обітниці? If you call yourself a Christian. Якщо ви називаєте себе християнином. Do you act like a Christian? Чи ти себе поводиш як християнин? Can people define you a Christian? Чи люди можуть тебе описати як християнина? Without hearing someone else call you a Christian by name. Чуючи, що тебе другі називають християнином. And finally. І на кінець. If you do happen to break a promise, якщо ви зламаєте обіцянку, if you do happen to fall short in weakness, якщо ви в своїй слабості не досягнете цілі, then be like Peter. Будьте як Петро. Do not lose your faith. Не губіть віру. And continue to go on to Christ. Але ідіть до Христа. Continue to look for Him. Більше шукайте Його. And continue to serve Him. І служіть Йому. Amen. Amen. Before we pray, I would like to. Um, Call out a couple of prayer, a couple of prayer requests. Перед тим як ми помолимося, я хочу оголосити декілька нужд. Our first one would be um, our sister Sofia. It was her birthday. Перше всього сестра Софія, це було її день народження. It was her birthday yesterday. We pray that God blesses her. 
Це I pray for everybody who is at home. Молюся за всіх, хто вдома. Who is taking this time? Хто бере цей час? To draw closer to God. Щоб приблизитись до Бога. I pray that we use this time wisely. Я молюся, що ми цей час використаємо мудро. And I pray that God continues to use our youth to glorify his name. І що Бог буде використовувати нашу молодь, щоб прославити своє ім'я. And I want to pray especially for the needs of this church. Я хочу помолитися за нужди нашої церкви. And the leadership of this church. І за лідерів нашої церкви. Let us bow our heads and pray. Давайте схилимо свої голови і помолимося. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we had here today, Father, to hear your name, to hear your name be glorified, to hear the sermons that we heard, to let it, allowing us to worship here, Father. For all those who were not able to come here, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to do so virtually in our homes and to glorify your name from the places where we, where we were at, Father. I pray that you continue to be with us, continue to lead us in all the things that we do. I pray, Father, especially for our youth. I pray for the young men that you fill them with the Spirit, Father, they may preach your name and glorify your name, Father. I pray that you bless the sisters that may testify of your love and testify of all the things that you've done in their lives, Father. Let our youth continue to serve you, continue to be with you, and continue to desire you above all else, Father. Let us live by the word, Father. Let us live in truth. Let us not stray to the left or the right. Let us not be blown by the wind and by this world, Father. I pray that you hold us tight in your hand and let nothing take us from you. Father, you see the needs of our church. You see all those who are sick. You, th you see all those that have some kind of problem going on in their life, any kind of burden or um, any kind of burden that they are shouldering, Father. Let us take it up as a church in prayer to you, Father, because you are the one who can help. You are the only one who could take that burden off of our shoulders, Father. I pray that you continue to bless our church, continue to be, be with the leaders. Give them wisdom, give them strength, Father. Let them endure in this time, Father. Let us continue to desire you above all else. Father, we also pray for Sister Sophia. You saw it was her birthday. I pray that you continue to protect her, Father. Continue to use her. Continue to work on her in her life, Father, that she may glorify your name. Continue to open up her talents to her, Father, that she may serve you in her life, Father. I pray that you continue to bless this youth. Continue to be with us at all times. Let us look to you when there is any kind of problem or any situation, Father. I pray that you be with us at all times. In your name we pray. Amen. Отче наш, що живеш на небесах, нехай святиться ім'я Твоє, нехай прийде царство Твоє, нехай буде воля Твоя, як на небі, так і на землі. Хліб наш щоденний, подавай нам на кожен день, і прости нас провини наші, як і ми прощаємо винуватцям нашим. І не веди нас у спокусу, але визволи від лукавого, бо Твоє царство, сила і слава, повіки. Амінь.